Meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight I'm joined by Barrister Sam Fowles, and our left in the corner is Bill Rammel. He's a former Labour minister. We've also got Chloe Dobbs on the show for the first time. She's a political commentator and three times boxing world champion, Duke McKenzie. But first, let's go to the news. Good evening, the top stories. Police are searching for other body parts after the discovery of a torso at a Salford nature reserve. Greater Manchester Police says the human remains were found wrapped in plastic by a member of the public at Curzel Dale. The gender and age of the person are currently unknown, but police believe it was an adult. A murder investigation is now underway and a search is taking place in the local area. Chief Superintendent Tony Creeley says detectives need a breakthrough in this tragic case. We believe that these remains are likely to have been here for a matter of days and it really is a tragic case. Our priority now is establishing who this person is and ensuring that we carry out a diligent and respectful investigation on behalf of that person and their family, whoever they may be. We are speaking to those locals uh, in the area, dog walkers, passers-by or anyone else who, might, who may have the smallest bit of information. Huge crowds have been taking part in protests in Westminster, hundreds of pro-Palestinian protesters taking part in the annual Al-Quds Day demonstrations marched from the Home Office to Downing Street. Pro-Israel counter-protesters were also present, waving flags on Parliament Square and chanting for the release of the hostages being held by Hamas. The Met Police says two men have been arrested on suspicion of inciting racial hatred after an Israeli flag was burned during demonstrations. It says new powers to prevent disruptive protests come into force, with offenders facing up to six months in prison or an unlimited fine. The Foreign Secretary is calling for a wholly independent review into the killing of three British aid workers in Gaza. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were among seven World Central Kitchen workers who were hit by Israeli airstrikes. Lord Cameron has welcomed the dismissal of two IDF officers and says the UK will now carefully review the findings of an initial report on the incident. 
Government security experts have been called in to analyse the WhatsApp messages at the heart of the Westminster sex scandal. So far, around a dozen MPs, staff and journalists are known to have been targeted. And sources have told GB News more are coming forward. It's after Tory MP William Rad told The Times he'd sent intimate pictures of himself to someone on a gay dating app and was then manipulated into providing phone numbers. He's expected to be contacted today and will be asked for a list of the numbers he shared. Millions of people will receive a boost in take-home pay from tomorrow following a cut to employee national insurance. From the start of the new tax year, Class 1 contributions will be reduced from 10 to 8%. Meanwhile, a further 2 million self-employed people will see their Class 4 national insurance reduced from 8 to 6%. The government says around 29 million workers will benefit from the changes. And a planned strike by over 600 Border Force officers at Heathrow Airport has been suspended. Members of the Public and Commercial Services Union were due to walk out for four days from April the 11th in a dispute over rosters which the union said threatened job losses. The union now says that following the Home Office's desire for clarification and in a spirit of collaboration, it suspended those strikes. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World and tonight we're going to discuss Scotland's new controversial hate crime law and joining me for the debate is Sam Fowles, he's a barrister and columnist and former Labour Minister Bill Rammel. Bill, I'm going to come to you first because you're quite strong on this subject. This, this new legislation in Scotland, it, um, it makes it illegal to stir up hatred. I thought that was already illegal anyway in the United Kingdom. But is this a step too far? Have the lunatics taken over the asylum? Well, I think the act is an abomination. You know, you can seek to tackle extremism as, as we do through prevent, as long as you draw the line at violent extremism. Yeah. You can seek to outlaw discrimination as we do through the Equalities Act, but using the civil law. But to seek to criminalise free speech, I, I think it's a dog's breakfast. You know, if someone says a black person is less intelligent than a white person, I think they're wrong, I think they're offensive, I think they're ignorant. But you can't use the law to tackle that. You need free speech and open debate to take on the arguments. And, and I actually think this act will be unenforceable. Makes a good point there, Sam. Is this act is making ignorance illegal, surely? Yeah. Well, given that uh, when Bill was in government, the Labour government introduced an act that did pretty much exactly the same thing in, in England, clearly it is enforceable because it's been enforced uh, uh, for the past, what, 20 years. The Conservative Party in 1991 also did, uh, did the same thing in terms of race. So it's been enforced in the UK for years. And this isn't inf uh, criminalising ignorance. It's criminalising putting people in danger. It targets threats and it targets abuse. And we have, um, in Scotland and in the UK... As oh, hold on a minute, Sam. But when, when, you, when you have a go at these people, you know, based on their age, disability, religion, sexual mm -hmm. orientation, transgender identity, etc., when you're having a go at these people and stirring up hatred, surely that is ignorance? It, it certainly makes you ignorant, but that's not what the law criminalises. It criminalises threats and abuse. And so that isn't just saying, I don't like black people, I don't like gay people. It's like it's, it's saying because I think gay people are a, a, an abomination or their, uh, their relationships are less valuable, we should go out and hurt them. We should do something that, uh, that makes their lives a misery. That's threats and abuse. And what we're seeing in the UK, and particularly in Scotland at the moment, is an increase over the last, uh, over recent years, in violent hate crimes against minorities. And those, are, those increases are in direct correlation yeah. with an increase in people saying things online and in public that are inciting people uh, to, to hate and to attack and to discriminate against them. And so we need, if we're going to protect people from yeah. violence, we need to address the causes of violence. It's worked in, uh, in England. That's what we need to do. In uh, Bill, I'm going to come back to you now because Sam, he, he thinks he makes some reasonable points. He sort of blame, puts the blame at your door when, when you was in government. But if we look at some of the teachings in the Bible, I'm fairly sure that some of those teachings in the Bible, they, they stir up some sort of hatred against minority groups. 
Yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not advocating that, that you promote hatred, but this legislation is drawn much more widely than the previous UK-wide uh, legislation. And, you know, you, you can actually anonymously report hate crimes under this. You can actually, in Scotland, report anonymously in sex shops and mushroom farms. You know, this is, it's got echoes. What, what kind of mushrooms, Bill? Uh, not sure. I don't think they're magic is it, is mushrooms. Is it magic mushrooms? No, I don't think so. I think that's but, where we're but, going. But it's got echoes of, you know, the East German Stasi, yeah. where parents were encouraged to report on their parents for being insufficiently I communist. Mean, and, and you can't use the law to outlaw people's views. You need to challenge them, you need to expose them, yeah. and you need to take them on with free speech and debate. This legislation will not help. Is it killing free speech, Sam? Well, no. Well, first, it's, it's actually drawn less widely than the, uh, than the, the law that uh, the bill introduced in government, because this, this just looks at threats and abuse, whereas uh, the one that Bill introduced, uh, Bill's government introduced also include in, included insults. Secondly, it's not criminalising beliefs, it's criminalising using your belief as an excuse to bully people and encourage uh, violence and abuse uh, against them. Yeah. It's perfectly fine uh, to have beliefs. The law doesn't criminalise that. It's perfectly fine to express those beliefs. I think the law doesn't criminalise that. Bill's chomping it's, at the bit here, um, Sam. Let, let, criminal. Let, let him come back in. OK, come on then. If, if it's simple and straightforward, why has it taken three years from the passing of the legislation to enactment? Yeah. It's taken that long because the police have got an almighty task of drawing up guidelines of what will be a hate crime and what will not be a hate crime. And, and you know, the training for the police in Scotland, just two hours yeah. online to be, make, to be making incredibly sensitive, important judgments. And I actually think it will eventually just wither on the vine or it will be repealed. And this is the thing, Sam, we see the police when we see these horrific uh, graphics being projected onto Elizabeth Tower, you know, from the river to the sea. We all know what that means. They stand idly by when that, for me, is steering up hatred. They do nothing. How are the police different in Scotland? How are they going to look at these reported crimes? 3,000 since Monday, uh, these so-called hate crimes have been reported to the police. How are they going to investigate them properly? In the same way they do in the, in, in the rest of the, the UK, in, in England. When you... What, like Elizabeth Tower? Yeah, because projecting from the river, uh, from the river to the sea, Israeli politicians say from the river to the sea all the time. Palestinian politicians say from the river to the sea. Yeah, but we all know what it means, don't we? Uh, well, I know what it means. Yeah. It's talking about pal uh, the Palestine after Israel was created okay. uh, and before the uh, the Israeli government started using bulldozers to turf Palestinian people off their off their land. That's what the, from the river to the sea uh, means to me. So I don't think uh, from the river to the sea is, is particularly uh, offensive or, or abusive, and I think it's been uh, stirred up in bad faith. But you're not Jewish, are you? Uh, uh, no. And the police, though, are competent and capable of determining um, what is likely to be pro uh, prosecutable and really? what is not. Really? And, well, in, they should be, at least. And th okay. But this is a, it's a matter for the police to figure out okay, how to enforce okay, okay. the law. Let's, let's, let's try and talk about something yeah. that we might agree on, guys, and that is the, uh, the flag. The flag of St George and, and the Union flag we've seen over the past few weeks. Certain organisations are trying to interfere with the flag. Is it time, Bill, to leave our flag alone? I think so, yes. I mean, I'm fed up with commercial organisations designing different types of flags for commercial reasons. I don't think this is actually driven by ideology. You know, Nike was rubbing its hands when it got about three days' worth yeah. of marketing and publicity yeah. whilst the debate was raging uh, on the airways and on the TV. You know, we do have a national flag. We have a national identity. You, you, you apply your own values to that national identity, but I don't think you should change the flag. Sam. I mean, I think, well, I think we have started on the magic mushrooms now. We've just been talking about how important freedom of speech is, and then, but not freedom of speech when it comes to the flag. If, you're, if you believe in freedom of speech, then do what you want with the flag. It's a, a, embrace it. It's, it is part of our national heritage, and part of our national heritage is growing and building and changing and developing, and the flag should be a part of that. So to have a conversation where we say, well, if people are threatening, uh, th threatening minorities, that's free speech, but God forbid we do a bit of art with the flag. I mean, that's just, that's just bonkers to but me. It, but, but, but I'm not prescribing yet. I'm not saying you should take legal action over yeah. that. I'm saying it's not sensible, and I think the vast... I think we've got a mix-up this week, uh, guys. I'll, I'll speak to the producer later, we should, I think you should be the left in the corner. I think <laughs> Bill should be sat over here because this is this is astounding. But look, I mean, the flag—it is part of our history, our heritage, our culture—and it's not 
you know, the consensus of the British public is to leave it alone. You've got these wokey, you've got these multi-billion pound organisations trying to interfere. And I'll ask you this then, Sam, if it, if it doesn't matter, how many other countries around the world are swapping their flag or changing Ooh. the colours on it? Just Ooh. name me one. I mean, in the United States, for example, really? you get the, um, in, in the United States, you've got police who wanted to um, uh, sort of have a go at the Black Lives Matter protesters, changed the United States flag to make a little thin blue line flag, made the United States flag black and white. Yeah. Um, in the UK, the Conservative Party and UKIP have both changed the colour of the of the Union flag. Uh, UKIP, I think, made it, made it purple. The Conservatives made it all, all blue. Um, I think uh, Labour may, may well have done so as, as well. Making putting the flags in, in different colours and using them for sort of pop art, yeah. that's been going on for ages. And I think to sort of just... It's, this is a, it's a totally confected But I think issue. the good news is, Bill, that the, uh, the uh, Olympics, the British Olympic team, are going to wear the proper uh, Union flag on, on, their, on, their, um, on their kit. They are, I think that's good news. But, but the other problem I have with it is there is an agenda on the right of politics of wanting to, cr to fight culture wars. Yeah. And I think organisations, people who try to change the flag are actually giving grist to that mill uh, and giving ammunition uh, and I don't think we need that kind of debate. You know, we, we have a national flag, yep. it's been there for centuries, we should leave it as it is. Yep. Final word to you Sam. Look, free speech is important, it's a foundation stone of democracy but we shouldn't be using free speech to attack and hate people. We should be able to discuss issues um, without uh, without being abusive and threatening. This discussion about the flag, that's a great example of how three people can really disagree about something, have completely opposing views, and discuss it in a reasonable manner. It's not hard to do that, and I think that's, that's what we should take away and embrace. Well, thank you for that. Thanks, guys. That was really good. Thank you for being a good sport, Bill, being left in the <laughs> corner. But next time, you're going to be sat th here, and Sam will be sat there. <laughs> but do not go away, because coming up next, we've got three-time former world champion, Duke McKenzie. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. The real danger to our democracy, of course, always was China. And we learn overnight, we'd heard in August last year that the Electoral Commission's website had been compromised, their database had been compromised. And we learn overnight that, yes, actually, the Chinese Communist Party now have access to 40 million voters in this country and their data. Well, to respond to this in the House of Commons earlier, we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities and parliamentarians around the world. Well, I don't know how tough that sounds to you in terms of a response, but one member of Parliament, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, was, shall we say, less than impressed. And whilst I welcome these two sanctions uh, from the government, it is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. The reality is that in those three years, uh, the Chinese have trashed the Sino-British agreement. They have been committing murder and slave labor and genocide in Xinjiang. We have had churches broken and in Hong Kong, false uh, court cases against Jimmy Lai. Great quote, elephant giving birth to a mouse. I rather like that. Sir Ian's here. I'll ask him about where that came from in a moment. But it's all going to be OK. It's all going to be absolutely fine. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. 
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We're back in the day now with uh, former three-time world weight, world champion, boxing champion, Duke McKenzie. We just spoke earlier, Duke. You were one of the people I used to watch on the TV in the 80s. You boxed in the 80s. Yeah. World champion at three different weights. That's pretty incredible. I'm one of the lucky ones there. I consider myself very, very lucky, very, very fortunate in terms of luck. I mean, I had a great manager in Mickey Duff. God rest his soul. He's no longer with us. And um, he managed me and guided my career from day one. You know, British champion, European champion, world champion, world champion defences, uh, both here and abroad. So I consider myself one of the lucky fighters. Like I say, um, 42 fights, uh, 35 wins, and uh, I've lived to tell the tale. I think you've been a bit modest there about being um, lucky, Jude. There's a lot of hard work and dedication um, comes into it. I know you have to give your life up. You must have started boxing at a young age. What first got you into boxing? My older brother Clinton was my main inspiration as a young man. Uh, he went to the 1976 Olympic Games, boxed Sugar Ray Leonard in the quarterfinals. Wow. Yep. Uh, huge inspiration. My brother Clinton's actually like my dad, to be honest with you. Yeah. We're yeah. more than brothers. Uh, you know, more like best friends, really. We talk pretty much every day. Yeah. But Clinton was my main source of inspiration, as my brother Dudley was also, another outstanding amateur boxer. So, um, by the time I came into the boxing world, although I wasn't supposed to have won anything because my dad wasn't my biggest fan, but um, I pretty done, I done pretty well. Yeah, done right, game. Yeah. yeah, I done all right. So, which, which boxers, apart from your brothers, obviously, when mm -hmm. you was growing up, did you look up to? Roberto Duran. Hard man. Yeah, listen, the hands of stone. Obviously, the great legendary Muhammad Ali was another massive inspiration. But there's also quite a few British fighters back in the day. Yep. Uh, John Conti yep. was a, a big inspiration for me growing up as a young man, you know? So fitness-wise, back in the day, let's talk about present-day boxers. Obviously, they have different diets, different training regimes, different sort of management, and yep. they're in your face a little bit more. Is it fair to, to compare boxers of today with those of your generation? Probably not. It's a completely different generation, and I, th I do believe boxing back in the day was a lot harder than it is now. Boxing today is more about uh, entertainment. Yeah. You know, you got to entertain. Yeah. If you want to be a star of success in this sport, you have to be an entertainer. So you know, there's the show business of the sport, yeah. and there's the fight business. They're two separate entities, and unfortunately, they don't really match that well. But you see the money on offer now. You see in these fights in Saudi Arabia, which are unthinkable. Yeah. You know, back in the day, and you see some of these YouTubers coming on the scene, and you know, there's about six months training, they want to get in, in, in the ring with a, a proper boxer. Is that a good for boxing, or, or is it a bad thing, you think, Jim? Probably commercially, it's great for the sport, because it brings a whole new audience to the sport. However, as you've seen with the recent, say, Anthony Joshua fight against yeah. Ngano, Ngano should never have been in there with, with Anthony Joshua, and could have got seriously hurt, and then that tarnishes the sport. You know, I mean, he, Joshua invited him to lift his chin up and said, just lift your chin up, move it over six inches, and took a pot shot at it, and absolutely destroyed him, you know. I mean, he um, could have got very, very seriously hurt and gone. You know, he got knocked out, and it was a bad knockout. He was. And, but I'm sure if you put me in against a guy that had two fights, even at 60 years of age, even now, I pretty much do the same thing. Really? You know, yeah, well, you know, I mean, listen, there's, that's why boxers box, and yeah. MMA guys do their chosen profession. They've got to stay in their lane, and boxers stay in their lane. Yeah. If you take one out of, out of their own profession and take them into the other guy's backyard, then I'm sure... If, uh, Joshua had gone into MMA, and then Ogana was done. Yeah, same to him. I think you make a fair point there, dude. Because I've seen in the past, was it was it Mayweather? He got in the ring, with forty odd years old with sure uh, with a um, McGregor, was it? Or yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. yeah, you make a fair point. So you spoke about Muhammad Ali. Yeah, he was probably the one that got me interested in boxing. You know, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I can remember the I think it was the Thriller in Manila. Thriller in Manila. Uh, sure. when, when my dad, I was probably four or five years old. Sure. At the time. My dad was a big fan. We stopped up and watched watched that. That fight and that yeah. was the um, rumble in the jungle, weren't yep. it? Yeah, so, yep. um, there were so incredible. many great fights, so many great fights from the 70s. And back in the day, it was on um, ITV and yeah. it was like World of Sport with yeah. Dickie Davies, and then yeah. it went on to the BBC, you know, with the late Harry Carpenter. 
So, you know, boxing was free then. You'd get it every day, every Saturday. There was a world title fountain from Caesars Palace, Las Vegas, yeah. or, or Atlantic City, or wherever it was from around the world. And it was always massive. It was always great to watch. It was like, it was more than boxing. It was an event. I know, but boxing, for, for young men especially, especially in places um, where I live, there's, there's, there seems to be boxing clubs springing up all over the place. And, you know, back in the day, it was one. In, in all of my area now, every, on every high street now, there's, there seems to be a gym. So you've got girls and boys doing it now. So it's a big draw. Yeah, boxing is a very will always be uh, a very fashionable way to keep fit yeah. and look after yourself. It's a great way to release your, you know, uh, uh, tension and you know it's great for meditation. It's great for your mental state of mind as also, um, and it's great for the young kids. Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean it's a brilliant sport. discipline as well. It's not about just going in there and. Knocking seven bells out of no. a punch bag, is it? No, no, no. Boxing will give you life skills. Yeah. You know, all that I am, all that I will ever be out to the sport of boxing has yeah. taught me so much. Boxing even teaches you how to cook because you have to become self-sufficient yeah, yeah, yeah. and look after yourself. Do you see what I mean? So if you were, if you not had um, become a boxer, what would you have done? I'd have been an actor. An actor <laughs> now listen, I'd love to listen. I like to, I like to liken myself to Denzel Washington <laughs> in Training Day. You know, like in my little gym, I give you little little slip bits from that film. It's one of my favourite films, by the way. What's your favourite? What's your favourite film? Uh, my favourite film is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yeah. Robert Redford, Paul Newman. That's yeah. actually a western. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, that's the other seven. But that's that's my favourite film of all time. But favourite Denzel Washington film? Uh, Training Day. Training that, yeah, he's just uh, Denzel. He's a legend, isn't he? He's one of them actors, a bit like Clint Eastwood. They never make a bad film, do they? Nah, absolutely. You can watch him in anything, you know, like yeah. Book of Eli is another great film. Yeah, you know, there's just so many great films that he's made over the years. And I mean, listen, I'd love to be an actor, but the reality is, I'd, I only act. It's in never, too late, it? <laughs> never too late, is it? Never too late. I don't know, isn't it? You, have you got a contact for me? <laughs> Fascinating discussion, Duke. Thanks. Um, coming up next, we've got right versus left with Chloe Dobbs and Bill Rammel, and I think Duke's coming back later. Hello, good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Storm Kathleen is on the way for this weekend. It will turn unseasonably windy, but it's also going to turn unseasonably warm as well. Here's Storm Kathleen developing to the southwest of the UK. That's approaching through the next few hours to bring some rain to pop more southwestern areas through the next few hours. That rain will turn quite heavy as it moves into parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Further south, though, as the night progresses, it will turn that much drier, but the winds will really start to pick up through the early hours of Saturday, particularly across the southwest here. However, it's a southerly wind. It's dragging up exceptionally mild air. So it's going to be around 12 or 13 degrees to start the day on Saturday for many of us. So it's going to be a very mild day across the east as well. It should stay largely dry through much of the day, but you will notice that breeze. But it's in the west where we'll see the strongest winds. There is a wind warning in force for Northern Ireland, many western areas of Scotland, Wales and England. Here there's likely to be some travel disruption. So if you are travelling about, make sure you check before you travel on Saturday. But in the east, where it's a little bit more sheltered and warmer, we could see 22 degrees on Saturday. Now, Sunday's going to be another fairly mild day, but there's going to be more in the way of showers for central areas of England, Wales, the southwest as well. These could turn heavy. The winds will also remain very strong across the far north of Scotland on Sunday. Into Monday, northern areas will likely stay fairly unsettled, but it looks like it could turn a little bit drier across the south, with temperatures returning closer to average. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Joining me now for Right versus Left, I have political commentator Chloe Dobbs on the show for the first time. Welcome, Chloe. And we've got Bill Rammel, former Labour Party, former Labour MP and Minister. We're going to get straight to it. Uh, it was this week again, well, last weekend, we saw over a 1,000, or well, nearly a 1,000, uh, migrants crossed the channel into this country. Nothing seems to be working. I mean, uh, the, the government was saying, and number 10 was saying, that um, crossings are down by 36%. They're now up by 40%. Uh, they're now saying it's, it's the weather. Uh, the good weather is allowing more people to come over the channel. Uh, we was making the argument a few months back that they, it was the bad weather that was stopping people. They wouldn't agree to that. So, Chloe, what's going to stop this once and for all? I think that we need to tow the boats back to France. That's the only way that we're going to stop it. I think this Rwanda plan, we can give it a shot, but I doubt that it's really going to do anything, and it's going to cost us apparently 172 grand per person. We're now offering them three grand free pocket money as an incentive, apparently, yeah. uh, which is completely yeah. insane. I'm sure a lot of hard-working Brits that can't afford to put food on the table would quite like free grand at a time like this. Uh, Rishi Sunak just doesn't have the backbone to do what's necessary. OK, well... Uh, I think we need to tackle the problem, but we need to put it in context. It's about 30,000 a year coming over on the boats. The numbers of people being granted visas last year was 1.4 million. You know, the government has many more levers as, at its disposal to tackle uh, immigration. Uh, I think the Rwanda bill is a gimmick. It's hugely expensive. It's legally full of holes. And I think you need to uh, get better returns agreements in place. You need to clear the asylum backlog, which is what Labour did when we were in power. You know, the net migration figure is now three times as high as it you was. You say that, though, but what happens when you see some of these young men that come over, and we know that they do it, they, they lie about where they come from. So I can have a returns agreement with a country when these people are blatantly lying on which country they've started off from. But they always have. I mean, when I was a minister in the last Labour government, we were grappling with the uh, asylum challenge. I will acknowledge in our early years in government, we didn't get it right. But over the last five, six years, we dramatically reduced the number of asylum seekers. It needs serious application in, go in government, not gimmicks and stunts, which is what we're having from Sunak. Chloe? I think that, yes, we need to clear the asylum backlog and so yeah, but, on, but... When we clear the backlog, what happens? What we do is we pass about 80% of the claims to give them, uh, give them refugee status. Then They then go into social housing and, and take up all the housing, and the mm. other 20% just go missing. But, but you begin to reduce the pull factor. One of the biggest pull factors for illegal migrants coming to this country is they know they'll come here and their claim won't, won't be dealt with for two or three years. That's, that's a, They a know that they'll sign. come here and get a five-star hotel to stay in for free. That's they, what brings them they here. They don't get five-star hotels. Oh, I've seen plenty of videos of the accommodation that they get. It looks pretty nice, some of Neither it. Neither you or I would want to live in the accommodation that they're living in. Regardless, they're getting a free home for coming here illegally they've broken the law and you've pointed out the fact that the numbers are much smaller than net legal mm -hmm. migration however the problem with this even though the numbers are much smaller is that these are undocumented young males a lot of the time coming from the countries that have the worst record in the world for their treatment of women by the way mm -hmm. um, the home office is refusing to reveal to gb news the number of asylum seekers who have committed uh, sexual crimes um, this is extremely scandalous. That's why, even though the numbers are small, it's such an issue. This is a really big national security issue. Well, I mean, I actually agree with you. If you've committed a sexual crime, a crime, you shouldn't be eligible uh, for asylum. But we shouldn't country. have to wait for them to come here and rape somebody before we kick them out. No, and that's... Look at Abdul Azidi. He was yeah. allowed to stay here despite the fact that he was found guilty of sexual assault, I think on two occasions. Yeah. He was then allowed, because he came up with some bogus 
Christianity conversion, right? He shouldn't have come here in the first place. He came here on a lorry illegally. He should have been kicked out immediately, straight away. But, but you... And it wouldn't have happened. Those people wouldn't have been sexually assaulted, and that woman and her children would not have had acid thrown over them. But you can't assess that all in the moment. People have to have a right, and, and you know, we're party to international treaties that I think are the right way forward. You have to have a right to make a claim. But we need... A right to, to break into a country. No, no, you need to tackle the problem at source. And, you know, I'm not saying something that is impossible. We did it under the last Labour government and we had dramatically fewer numbers than we're having at the moment. The government is not serious about tackling the problem. So, Chloe, is, is there a Labour government? It looks like we're going to get a Labour government at uh, the back end of this year. Are they going to solve this crisis? I highly, highly doubt it. I don't think Keir Starmer has the backbone to do it, nor does Rishi Sunak. Um, but I think Labour will be worse because what Keir Starmer has done well on up to now is just not being the Tories and he's been able to get away with not really revealing what his policies are but as we get closer and closer to the election and he actually needs to say what he's going to do we're realising that a lot of his policies are absolutely bogus so when he was challenged on what are you going to do about the boats he suggested that we start cozying up to EU even more and come closer and closer to becoming a member again to, to solve this problem which to me sounds like dangerous territory. And that's because we do need to cooperate with Europe you know when we were in the European Union we didn't have 30,000 people People coming across the channel uh, through the boats because we had effective returns agreements in place. And I tell you this, if you say that... Yeah, but you say that, Bill, but when we were in the European Union, the, the Europe didn't have you know, hundreds of thousands of people coming over the, over the Mediterranean as well, did they? I, mean, I know there was a trickle started a few years back, but not to the amount of what we're getting today through Libya, through Italy, through the rest of Europe. Well, look, there's a whole series of worldwide uh, things happening that are growing the number no, of No, but you've just claims. stated, Bill, that the, the, the Labour was much better on this, and, and they weren't. They didn't have the situation to deal with what we've got today. Oh, we do. Go back to some of the influxes we had as a result of Afghanistan, as a result of uh, Iraq yeah. when we were in government. We actually tackled it. And you say we're not serious about it. I'll tell you this. I was not only a minister, I was the MP for a very, very marginal seat. And every conversation I had with Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in the last five or six years in government, the first thing they asked me was, ha what, what's, what's the perception of asylum and immigration uh, in your constituency? Because they were concerned genuinely about tackling the numbers. And we did. You know, look at, look at it in 2004 or 5, and the numbers were high. Look at the numbers by 2010, and they were down significantly. I'm pretty sure back in the day, I think Tony Blair suggested offshore, in, uh, offshore processing. We looked at it, uh, and I was part of that, but it was for processing. It wasn't for leaving them there per permanently. Okay. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems with the Rwanda scheme. Would that be a deterrent, Chloe, processing them offshore, maybe you know, somewhere thousands of miles away in a British colony? Uh, potentially, it would be better than what we've got now, where they just come here and sit in a hotel at the taxpayers' expense and wreak havoc in our communities. Um, but I don't think that Rwanda is a scary place to send people to. It is a safe country. And it's not a safe country. You know, not only the international courts, but domestic law has found uh, Rwanda to be unsafe. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think the government needs to do its work more effectively and isn't more the seriously. UN, isn't the UN being quite hypocritical there? They're telling us off of trying to send people to Rwanda whilst they've actually sent asylum seekers themselves to Rwanda, right? Yeah, I, I'm not responsible for the United Nations. What I do know so is... So you think they were wrong to no, say yeah, that? Yeah, and I think we need to operate within the law. You can do that effectively, but you need to do your homework, you need to do your research, and you need to choose the you location. You say operate within the law, Bill, but this is the thing that really, really winds <laughs> my constituents up. We keep hearing about international obligations, international law. People in places like Ashfield, where I represent, do not lie awake at night worrying about our reputation on the international stage. They want our country to be safe, they want our borders to be secure, and they want, we, they want us to stop these people coming into the country. They are, like Chloe says, I agree with Chloe, surprisingly, they are breaking into our country, they are abusing our asylum system, they are living in four or five star hotels, and then when we clear the backlog, which we seem to be bragging about all the time, that does no good at all, because then they go into social housing, and the rents in Asheville now are up 30, 40%, because housing now is at a premium, Chloe. So on the point about social housing, you've got so many Brits who are really struggling with a cost of living crisis, who can't afford to pay their bills. And meanwhile, we give, what, about half of social housing to immigrants? Yep. Which is just absolutely insane. We need to be putting Britain first. And, and we live in an era where people seem to think that it's racist if you prioritise a Brit over an immigrant. But I think that's just basic morality. That doesn't mean you shouldn't care about people at all from the rest of the world, but Brits have to come first. Yeah. Brits are being put at the back of the queue 
for everything. And, and now we live in a world where if you are a young, white, straight British male, you're seen as evil. It's, it's horrendous. I, I, I don't think that's true. And a whole host of local authorities are now designing their housing allocations policy where residency and longevity of residency is now the, re the key requirement. Uh, and Lee, you talk about, you know, just ripping up international treaties and obligations. The problem is that's a slippery slope. I was a foreign office minister, went round the world mm. trying to attract investment to this country. One of the things people are really attracted by is the certainty and the rule of law. Once you start rip, ripping up your international legal obligations, business is, is going to say, well, yeah. what's next? And that's going to yeah. cost us... And I, but I'll tell you what my um, constituents uh, are bothered about, Bill, that is letting rapists and murderers and sex offenders into our country, which we seem to be doing now and all, on a daily basis. We should stop that. We should stop that. And the way you stop it is by stopping them coming here in the first place. Turn backs, I agree with that. Mm. I agree with taking them back the same day. But there's no political will in that place over there, Chloe, to do this. And I don't think the Labour Party will do it either. Because, remember, when we've been debating this in Parliament for the last four years, it's always the Labour lot that keeps saying all the time that 80% of these people coming over are genuine asylum seekers. That's and we know, we know they're not. I mean, just look at the videos and the pictures of the boats coming in. If these are genuine asylum seekers, where are the women and children? Why aren't these men bringing their uh, vulnerable family members with them? Yeah. Just look at the pictures. It's all young males. Clearly, these are economic migrants. Now, I don't deny that some of them may be genuine refugees, but it looks like the vast majority are economic migrants. And also, if they are supposedly refugees, they are coming from northern France. So that is a safe place. They do not need to risk their lives and pay thousands of um, thousands of pounds or thousands of euros to some illegal gang members to come across to Britain. But, but you hit the nail on the head. In the European Union, we had the Dublin Convention and we could secure returns to country of origin elsewhere in the European Union. But they throw now, their we, passports, we, yeah, see. We, we don't even but, know where they're we're from. we're not in the European Union, but we need better cooperation and management with other European countries, and we're not going to get that by throwing stones from the sidelines. OK, throwing stones. Let's throw some more stones, guys. <laughs> yes or no quiz. You know the rules. It's a yes or no answer. You can't do a Stephen Pound and take 20 minutes to answer one question. It's got to be a yes or no. Okay? okay. So I'll go to you first, Bill. Do you agree with Scotland's new hate crime bill? No. <coughs> Chloe? No. Chloe, number two to you. Will Donald Trump win the US election? Yes. No. Bill, will the Rwanda scheme work? No. <laughs> Chloe? No. Chloe, should we leave the ECHR? Yes. No. Clear divisions here. And the final question, fire bell to you. Should we rejoin the EU? Uh, it's, it's not realistically achievable, no. So that's an incorrect answer. You did a Stephen Powell, you <laughs> answered yes or no. Stephen's a good man. Yeah, like, like so we, I can't give you, as a, that's crossed there, Chloe. No. Wow, 5-4. Five, 5-4. Four. Five, four. Do you want to come back on one and explain? You, you, you spoke about... Give me uh, Trump. Trump, yeah, go on, Trump. I think he'd be dangerous. You know, he talks about on day one uh, negotiating with the Russians, effectively giving in to the Russians over Ukraine. I think he'd be a danger for America and a danger for the world. It is very early in the race, and already the polls are tightening. And I think when push comes to shove, enough of the centre ground in, in America will not support him. And remember, he's never won the popular vote in America. Even when he beat Hillary Clinton, he lost the popular vote by three million. I think he's ahead now on the popular vote in America, Chloe. Trump is. But do you want to come back on one? Uh, I'll, I'll come back on Trump as well yeah. and ju just rebut that. So I think, first of all, I think that the race between Clinton and Trump looks is closer than between Biden and Trump because Biden, I mean, this is I'm sorry, but he is just a dementia patient. And that's just your opinion. No one trusts him on the world stage. And then and they trust look, Trump. And you and you say you say he's you say he's unsafe, Trump. But look at what's happening under Biden. The same problem we've got here, but on a much much worse scale. They've had what over seven million uh, illegal migrants um, come through the border. We even had Biden snuck in without telling anyone until recently. 320,000 illegal migrants. He's given them all in New York a bunch of credit cards, so like we're doing with our five-star hotels, um, giving them a free ride. And, you know, there's this theory that he's doing this because he wants the votes from them. Um, this is a huge security issue, and it is completely devastating communities there. Um, that or, or The states in America, even though geographically it's a big space, they're much less densely populated. And so that's 7 million that are coming through. That's bigger than, I think, the population of most 
most US states. And okay. people are really concerned about this. So people in Washington might be a bit out of touch, but people across America have had enough of this. And you talk about um, you know, the, the international realm. And although it is perhaps you know, slightly more questionable who's going to be safer, um, Biden or Trump, I think you want someone who is a strong negotiator who can stand up to other leaders. But he's not, I don't, it's not, Biden's oh, like a little kid. Hold on. It's, you talk about security. Two of the biggest security challenges we face are Russia and North Korea. And what did Donald Trump do when he was in office? He cozied up to them. When he sat down with Putin, he actually refused to accept the intelligence briefings he was getting from the CIA mm -hmm. about what Putin was doing. That is scandalous. Okay, and was... so we'll leave it there, guys. Uh, brilliant. Chloe, you're the clear winner. That's Must do it. better next time, Bill. <laughs> it's 5-4. But look, uh, coming up next, we've got Duke McKenzie. He's coming back for Last Orders. <laughs> GB News, Britain's news channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. It's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way and we already know that anyway, but it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore. And that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not that good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So, in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. So I'm joined once again by Jim McKenzie, three-time world champion, different weights. It's, it's incredible, that is. But you've got your own gym now. You told me earlier that you still do a little bit of training, Drew. You go jogging, you get, on the, you get in the gym once a week. How's that panning out? Yeah, the gym's going really, really well, my little duke box, we call it. Uh, we train just members of the general public and also quite, quite a few kids as well. And um, we have a lot of fun with them. A lot of kids actually look up to me as a bit of a father figure. You know, because some guys are coming from broken homes and one thing or another, don't go to school, don't attend school, I should say. And uh, I try to talk to them on my level, not necessarily on their level. And if you talk to them rationally and normally, then they pick up on it. And in turn, if I give them respect, then I'll get respect back. And that's how it works. 
Um, so, you know, the, the, the pavements are, aren't always paved with gold, the, or the streets aren't always paved with gold in boxing. A lot of uh, young men get into boxing, make a fortune, lose a fortune. Uh, yeah. We see ridiculous amounts of money in the sport these days, but you, you must come across fighters from your generation that's, that's come across hard times. Yeah, well, you know, I work closely with the uh, Ringside Charitable Trust, and they're an organisation which has been put together by um, Paul Fairweather and Dave Harris, and they look after specifically the boxers that have fallen on hard times, and we just yeah. try to raise the profile of that organisation, because what they're trying to do is to build a care home to, for retired boxers wow. to go to later on in life that have fallen on hard times. There's a lot of boxes out there, are drug, drug dependency, drink dependency, and just falling off, the, falling off the rails, if you see what I mean. But they just need, they need guidance, they need help. And without that organization's help, they will never make it. And they're gonna hear a lot more tragic stories. Why, why is it, dude, that some of these su supreme athletes that trained you know, for, 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 for donkey's years to get to the top of the game, once that's over, they sort of fall into this spiral and you know, end up on, on drugs and alcohol and end up being some, I would imagine, homeless or, you know, being in a, a really dark place. How does that happen? For a number of reasons, I'm sure. Uh, you know, people go through a divorce, they get bereft or, you know, something major happens and trips them up in life and you don't know what's around the corner. Fortunately, there is help out there for retired boxers now, with the help of the Ringside Charitable Trust, I might add, yeah. who are doing an amazing job to, like say, raise awareness for that organisation to help retired boxers that have fallen on hard times. Yeah. There isn't any one clear definition as to what's tripped anybody okay. up or why people turn to drink or drugs. It's just, it's one of them, really. It could happen to anybody, couldn't you? Yeah, it could happen to anybody. Talking yeah. about the jukebox, I like the name, the Duke. The jukebox yeah. is quite clever, that is. Who thought of that name? Probably my dog, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of young people, like we spoke earlier about people, you know, getting involved in boxing or any, any sort of sport. So, you know, I've had some really brilliant athletes on here. I've had um, Fatima Whitbread, right. it, was, it was sat where you are, and... Um, We've also had Chris Akabusi. Okay. Uh, he never stopped laughing for about, um, for yeah. about 10 minutes, sorry. But they spoke about, they've come, up, they've come through the care system. So right. They had a difficult upbringing. Right. But it was sport that rescued them. I mean, I'm not saying the sport that rescued you, but it gave you a career, didn't it? A glittering career. You know, my manager, Mickey Duff, always used to say to me, um, you're one punch from disaster, one punch from victory. And when you're managed in a certain way and spoken to moreover in, an, in another way, obviously very young, very quite introvert, quiet kind of a guy. But boxing, like I say, gave me so many, so much life skills. It gives you so much confidence. The training that you have to do once you get into it, and you can, you just saw really. Yeah. You can't really look back. I mean, fitness is for life, right? It's great for your physical health and your mental health, as you're sure you're well aware. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done, me, done wonders for me. Yeah. So I guess there's some young people, young boys and girls, want to go into that gym. They keep seeing the sign, you know, the boxing club. Yeah. But haven't got that confidence or, you know, then we've got uh, the parents or the support behind them to actually push them through that door. How do we make them go through that door, do you? A lot of it is, um, obviously, it's just choice, right? Yeah. But once kids actually get into boxing, you know, they just, they just need a good teacher. Yeah. And if you talk to kids on your level, not necessarily their level, yeah. they will listen because they're kids after all. Yeah. Like I say, I've got lots of kids in my gym and I talk to them like they're adults from day one. And just once you laid the, the, the laid down the law as it was of the gym, then they genuinely adhere to that law and you can have a lot of fun with these kids. Yeah. Some of the kids are quite introvert and very, very quiet. You know, might be getting bullied at school or college or uni or wherever it is they're going. But um, it's about giving the, the, the confidence you know, that's what boxing will teach you, if you can hold your hands up, yeah. you know, get fit, have a bit of fun while you're doing it, and uh, and it goes from there. And make some good friends as well along the oh, way. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've got some um, some real good friends in my gym, but also what I like to do with my gym is uh, nickname people. You know, I've got, listen, I've got a French Assassin, and I've got a Diana Ross, I've got a oh, Pocket yeah. I've got a pocket Rocket, you know, there's, but people like that association yeah. in the gym. And uh, you soon find they start to come out of themselves, and once they do that, then it's pretty much job done. So you had a great career. Yep. You must lie awake at night sometimes thinking, or, you know, and, and I pinch you know, reminisce. myself every night. Yeah, I pinch myself reminisce every night. Think, you know, I wish <laughs> they just caught him with, with one of them. Uh, well, you know, the money that's involved in the sport today, if yeah. I was boxers, I'd be a multi-gazillion, yeah. I'm sure. You, would, yeah. you know, but times have changed and times move on. You can't look back with regret. Mm. I've had my time and it's about the here and now. And um, But like I say, the, the money that's involved in the sport of boxing now, it's, it's phenomenal for the top end fighters. Yeah. Um, you know, but it will filter down through to the, the, the lower end fighters at some point, I'm sure. 
Um, but it's just it's changed now. And like I say, there's there's the fight game, then there's and then there's the, the fight business. And you have to understand these are two separate entities. So has it been, you know, all this money that's involved in Saudi Arabia and you see these $100 million fights, is, is, this, is this a force for good in, in the sport? I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. I mean, like I say, fighters now will get money like they've only dreamed about yeah. and some of them can't even fight. And they're getting like million, millions of pounds for, for fighting. Yeah. You know, and you've got, you've got YouTubers coming into the sport. And I'm not so sure, like I say, that's good for the sport. Yeah, yeah. You know, because somebody's going to get seriously hurt and then the anti-boxing brigade get out yeah. and say ban the sport. But fortunately, we've got the, probably the best governing body in British in world boxing, yeah. and that's the British Boxing Board of Control, who do a fantastic job. I'm not just saying it's not lip service. They do a fantastic job worldwide representing our fighters when we go abroad to fight, yeah. um, headed by Robert Smith, the uh, Secretary of the Board of Control. He does a fantastic job. Well, absolute pleasure. Thanks and it is a privilege to talk uh, to you, my privilege friend. Privilege is all mine, Thank, Thank you. That's Duke McKenzie. Thanks for joining Lee Anderson's Real World. We didn't do on the poll tonight, but that's coming up next week. We've got a cracking lineup as well next week. But coming up next, we've got Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Brilliant show. Thanks, Lee. Yes, indeed, Friday Night Live. Why are young women turning left wing? Should we burn everything from 150 years ago in case it's linked to slavery? Is the NHS now more unpopular than Harry and Meghan? Also, judges have been told to be lenient with people from a difficult background. Does that mean that a mugger will get less time inside if he didn't grow up with a soda stream? The world has gone mad. Also, as demand falls through the floor, are electric cars, glorified mobility scooters, and as he turns 60, can Nigel Farage make Britain Great again. We've got my Friday A team. It's a busy show. In fact, Friday Night Live has been given a lick of paint. Don't go anywhere. I'll see you in two. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Storm Kathleen is on the way for this weekend. It will turn unseasonably windy, but it's also going to turn unseasonably warm as well. Here's Storm Kathleen developing to the southwest of the UK. That's approaching through the next few hours to bring some rain to pop more southwestern areas through the next few hours. That rain will turn quite heavy as it moves into parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Further south, though, as the night progresses, it will turn that much drier, but the winds will really start to pick up through the early hours of Saturday, particularly across the southwest here. However, it's a southerly wind. It's dragging up exceptionally mild air. So it's going to be around 12 or 13 degrees to start the day on Saturday for many of us. So it's going to be a very mild day. Across the east as well, it should stay largely dry through much of the day, but you will notice that breeze. But it's in the west where we'll see the strongest winds. There is a wind warning in force for Northern Ireland, many western areas of Scotland, Wales and England. Here there's likely to be some travel disruption. So if you are travelling about, make sure you check before you travel on Saturday. But in the east, where it's a little bit more sheltered and warmer, we could see 22 degrees on Saturday. Now, Sunday's going to be another fairly mild day, but there's going to be more in the way of showers for central areas of England, Wales, the southwest as well. These could turn heavy. The winds will also remain very strong across the far north of Scotland on Sunday. Into Monday, northern areas will likely stay fairly unsettled, but it looks like it could turn a little bit drier across the south, with temperatures returning closer to average. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., I expose the activist civil service. They're political, they're undermining government policy, but should they be sacked? And devastating exclusive polling reveals whether or not the public want the government to release the details on how many asylum seeker sex offenders we have and whether we should leave the ECHR. Teachers are ignoring the government's advice on gender. One parent found out their child was trans at parents' evening. World famous author Lionel Shriver joins us on that. Patrick Christie's tonight, nine. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions, and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. A 